In the second unit, we are going to discuss the geometric image formation process and basic camera models. And we're going to see how points in 3D space are related to points on the 2D image plane. The principle of projection um, is an old one. And as an example, we can take, for instance, the human eye where light is passing through a lens and an aperture and is then collected by photoreceptors on the retina. And uh, the same principle holds true for the first camera obscura, which is collecting light through a little tiny hole that's made into the wall of an otherwise entirely dark room. And that gives rise to an image on the upper wall. And then all the way until photographic, the photographic camera has come to life. So here's an example of the camera obscura where an entirely dark room is illuminated by the light that is passing through this tiny little hole and creating an image of the objects outside of the scene outside upside down in this um, very dark room. Of course, because the aperture is so small and there's so little light coming into the room, um, you have to, um, you know, you have to adapt to the darkness of that room if you're standing inside that room to actually perceive something. It's actually just very little light. It's not very bright if you create such a camera obscura at home. But this has been used, um, you can find this in, in various museums, it has been used by artists. Here are some examples. And on this website, you find more examples where um, ordinary rooms have been illuminated using this principle of a very small pinhole. And then um, an image has been captured inside that room with a very long shutter time uh, and uh, giving rise to installations like you can see here by this artist. So um, the most basic physical pinhole camera can be described as a box that has a little hole inside one of the walls and uh, that hole is collecting light um, or is le letting uh, light pass through but it's letting light pass through only into the direction continuing where the light is coming from so we have a point here then that light passes through that hole and because light travels linearly along rays, um, that light is hitting this image plane, the sensor here on the back, exactly at one location. And because of this, the image that is projected is actually projected upside down onto that image plane behind this little hole in the wall, which is called a focal point because all the light rays that pass um, through this hole, must pass exactly through this hole, this focal point. However, when we consider camera models in this lecture, we typically consider the image plane to be in front of the focal point and not behind the focal point. So here's an example of, despite this being the physical model, the mathematical model looks like this here on the right. The distance from the focal point of this from from the focal point of this plane is the same as the distance of this image plane to this focal point, but in this case, the image plane is in front of the focal point. Now, in this case, the image of the three D object here is of the same size and the same shape as the image um, if it's projected behind the focal point. The only difference is that it's mirrored. And uh, so both models are actually equivalent, right? Um, they are just related by this um, mirroring. Um, so they can be brought into each other um, using a proper change of image coordinates. Now, in this lecture, we're considering this mathematical camera model, which has some um, advantages in the sense that uh, the image is not projected upside down, so we can we can directly see the image as um, we would see it uh, as humans. And that's also how digital cameras store images. They don't store the images upside down, but they store them um, in the right orientation. 
So this is what we can use as a replacement for this model because both are equivalent up to very uh, simple reflection. Now, if we talk about projection models, there's two basic projection models that are important. There's many more, but these two are the ones that we're gonna discuss here. And uh, if you wanna know about other projection models, I recommend having a look into the Sileski book, chapter 214. The first model that we're gonna discuss here is the so-called autographic projection model where light is um, assumed to travel um, parallel uh, to each other's ray um, on, onto and then projected in that parallel fashion onto that image plane. And in the perspective projection model, which is the pinhole camera model, we have a focal point and all the light rays um, that pass from a, any 3D point to that focal point, all the light rays must pass through that focal point, are hitting the image plane at the intersection of that line with the image plane. Right. So you can see that here in this case, the size of the object changes, while here the size remains the same. The object has the same 3D size as the dimensions on the image plane. And both of these projection models are relevant the traditional projection model is really the perspective projection model that is implemented or that can approximate almost all the cameras that we know, like our smartphones, our digital cameras, or DSLRs. But if we use a very large um, focal length, if we have a telephoto lens, then this perspective projection model can be well approximated by an autographic projection model the perspective effects vanish if we use a telephoto lens. And in some cases that's actually wanted. For instance, in applications where we wanna use optics for measurement. Here on the left, you can see a so-called telecentric lens that models exactly the autographic projection process. Because if you model that process exactly and you can measure distances then afterwards, after projection on the image plane, you know that these distances correspond one-to-one -to, -one to the distances in the real world. So this is used for inspection purposes, for instance. Here is a comparison between perspective and autographic projection and what they do to the image that is formed and that there is a continuous transition in between these two. And that's also what you're gonna play with and experiment with in the exercise. So here on the left, we have a classic, class, this is all the same cube, but here it's projected using a perspective projection where the vanishing point is um, in the vicinity and not at infinity. And we can see that these, these edges of that 3D cube that are all parallel to, it, to each other in 3D are intersecting at this vanishing point that we see here on this image. Now, if we increase the focal length, we come to a weak perspective setting or closer to a weak perspective setting where this vanishing point moves outside uh, this uh, image domain that we're considering here. And if we increase the focal length even further, if we um, move the camera infinitely far away from the object and at the same time increase the focal length to infinity, um, which of course is physically impossible, without such a telecentric lens, then we um, obtain an autographic projection here, um, where then all the lines that are parallel in 3D are actually also parallel in the image that is projected, in, in the image that we have captured with the camera. And here at the bottom you can see two examples of a perspective projection and a autographic projection or close to autographic projection of a real scene. So how can we describe these projections mathematically? Here we see the model for the autographic projection. And in all illustrations that I'm showing here, the illustrations are only showing the X and the C coordinate. The Y coordinate you can think of as going into the image plane here of this camera coordinate system in red. Um, but it's just difficult to draw in 3D and it's confusing. So I draw everything just as this cut in X and C dimensions, okay? 
So what we have here is, is the camera center, the origin where the camera coordinate system is defined. This is the XYC coordinate system where the 3D coordinates of a 3D point in 3D space are defined. And then in the autographic projection model, the image coordinate system falls together with the X and the Y axis, here only X illustrated again. So we have the X and the X axis of the image coordinate system in blue and the X axis of the camera coordinate system in red that are the same. And the same holds true for the Y axis. And now because the light rays travel parallel to the so-called principal line here um, uh, and parallel to each other, we know that if we have this point XC, C, C stands for camera coordinates and S stands for screen coordinates or image coordinates, we know that the X and the Y coordinates are actually remaining the same. So everything that we have done in this projection is we have removed the C coordinate, um, but X, S, so this is the, the 3D point and uh, the non bold version is the X coordinate of that 3D point. And that X coordinate of the 3D point is projected to the same value in the image plane. So the X coordinate in screen coordinates is the same value as the X coordinate in the camera coordinates. And the same hold true, holds true for the Y coordinate. So this is how an autographic projection of a 3D point, bold XC in 3D space, two pixel coordinates, bold XS in the 2D image domain here works. The Y and the X axis of the camera and the image coordinate systems are shared. The light rays are parallel to the C coordinate of the camera coordinate system. And during project, this is also called the principal axis here, this black one. And during projection, the C coordinate is dropped and X and Y remain the same. And uh, just uh, to highlight it again, the Y coordinate is not shown here for clarity, but you can think of the Y coordinate as, as going into the direction of um, the image plane, the direction we can see here but it behaves exactly the same. So how can we write this down in terms of linear algebra? Well, we know that an autographic projection simply drops the C component of the 3D point, but leaves the other coordinates the same. And so we can simply express this in inhomogeneous coordinates as such, where we have a 3D point multiplied with this two by three matrix where the last coordinate of this 3D point is multiplied with zero and the first and the second coordinate are copied. And we have an equivalent representation in homogeneous coordinates here with these augmented vectors in camera coordinates in 3D space. So this is a 4D vector. And here in screen coordinates, now this is a three-dimensional vector where we take this four-dimensional vector and the last element is a one because it's an augmented vector. So the last element of X, S will also be a one in this case. But of course, again, this can be replaced by any homogeneous coordinates. It doesn't need to be augmented vectors. Autography, as already mentioned, is exact for telecentric lenses and an approximation for telephoto lenses. And after projection, the distance of the 3D point from the image can't be recovered anymore, which is a property that holds true for all projections, also for perspective projection, of course. So after the projection onto the image plane, the distance is unknown. Um, now in practice, we're not going to use exactly that model that I've just shown because um, the image sensor typically measures in pixels. We define the image coordinate system in, in, uh, in pixels, not in millimeters or meters. And so we must scale the coordinates in order to be able to measure in pixels. And that's called scaled autography. And so what we have here is simply replace these ones with an S scaling factor. So we can scale um, the X and the Y coordinate that we're projecting and still dropping the C coordinate, of course. And the unit of this scaling factor is pixel over meter or pixel over millimeter, depending on the unit of the 3D point in order to be able to convert the metric 3D points into pixels. So let's assume we have 10 pixels per millimeter and we have a point that is at X 10 millimeters, then we would convert this into um, 
100 pixels. Under orthography, structure and motion can be estimated simultaneously using closed form factorization methods. And we're gonna see some of these methods in the next lecture. Now, um, having seen the simple orthographic projection model, we, we come to the perspective projection model, which is a model that we need for almost all traditional cameras, where light rays are focused at a single focal point, which is here, the camera center. So here is an example of how a 3D point XC in camera coordinates projects to pixel coordinates XS in, um, so here's the image plane now, in the screen coordinates. As you can see now, the image plane and the image coordinate system are not co-located with the camera coordinate system anymore as before. Um, but the image plane is displaced from out of the camera center and all the rays that are um, no, um, all the rays, all the light rays here must pass through this focal point, through this camera center. So there's always the light ray that passes through the camera center, the pixel S, XS, and the point, 3D point XC. This is the constraint. And the convention here is that the principal axis is, which is this one here, is orthogonal to the image plane and aligns with the C axis. Um, so it's called the principal axis. And again, y, the Y coordinate is not shown here for clarity, but it behaves similarly. So how does a 3D point now project mathematically to this point XS? Well, for this 3D point, we know the X coordinate and we know the C coordinate in 3D camera coordinates. And for this image coordinate, we know the X coordinate on screen in pixels, let's say, and we know the focal length F. Right. This is the focal length, that is the distance of the image plane from the focal point. That's a parameter of cameras. We can change it. If we have a zoom lens, we can change the focal length. That will change how big the object will appear on the image plane. You can already imagine changing this will change the size of the projection onto the image. Because the image plane moves, it translates left to right. Now, what is the relationship that we can infer from this uh, geometric constellation? Well, we see that there's a set of equal triangles. So we have this triangle here, X, S and F. So if we divide X, S divided by F, we have must, we must have the same, not, we, have, we must have the same ratio as if we divide X, C by C, C, just by the principle of equal triangles. So we have this triangle, this big triangle here, and this little small triangle here. And this is what I've written here on the right hand side. So in other words, I can solve this for XS by saying, well, the pixel coordinate X is equal to XC divided by CZ multiplied with the focal length F. And this is exactly the pinhole projection formula. And it also holds for Y, of course, Ys is equal to Yc divided by Cc times F. Now we can also formulate this mathematically in terms of a matrix multiplication if we use homogeneous coordinates. So as we've seen in perspective projection, 3D points and camera coordinates are mapped to the image plane by dividing them by their C component and multiplying with the focal length. That's what we've just derived and this is this expression here in for both the x and the y coordinate in uh, regular inhomogeneous coordinates. Now, while this is a nonlinear expression, because we have to divide by c, in homogeneous co coordinates, we can write this as a linear equation. So assume a matrix called a camera matrix or projection matrix. There's a three by four matrix here with the focal length on the diagonal and zeros in the last column. And if we, if we multiply this with the homogeneous four-dimensional um, augmented vector xc of the 3D point, then we obtain, well, um, xcf 
um, YCF and then the third coordinate CC. Um, and if we now not, this is a homogeneous, three dimensional homogeneous vector. And if we normalize that homogeneous vector into an augmented vector where the last element is one, we obtain exactly FXC over CC and FYC over CC in the first two uh, elements of this vector. Right, so by using this homogeneous representation, because we have these points that are all equivalent to each other, and by the definition of conversion from homogeneous coordinates to inhomogeneous coordinates, um, we are representing the projection process so that we can express this entire process here with a simple linear multiplication if we assume homogeneous coordinates and then afterwards do the conversion to inhomogeneous coordinates by dividing by the third element of the homogeneous vector. So the important point here is this projection is linear when using homogeneous coordinates. And after the projection again, as in the autographic case, it's impossible to recover the distance of the 3D point from the image. As a little remark, the unit for F is typically chosen as pixels to convert metric 3D points um, into pixels. If you look at this expression here, if we have a, a 3D point that's expressed in meters, so we have X and C being defined as meters, but the screen, screen coordinates are supposed to be in pixels, then of course the unit of F has to be also defined in pixels because the meters cancel here. And so the only thing that remains is the screen coordinate in pixel. And that's why the focal length in our models that we're using is often gonna be defined in pixels. This is the most basic form of the pinhole projection principle, <clears throat> but we can add more parameters. And one important parameter is the so-called principal point. Why do we need a principal point? Well, in the previous model that I've explained, the image coordinate system, and this is now a 3D illustration of uh, this one here, the image coordinate system is defined in on the principal axis, is centered on the principal axis, but it's inconvenient to store pixels with negative coordinates. Consider a pixel here that would have negative coordinates with respect to that coordinate system. So what is done is in practice is, and also I have already, as you can see here, oriented the coordinate system in a way that is convenient to store images. What we can do here is we can move that coordinate system to the top left of the image. So this is the, the viewpoint here. So looking from behind, this is the top left uh, corner of the image. And so the, the first pixel here will, if we move this coordinate system, will be located at zero, zero or one, one, if you use a one based coordinate system, which is much more convenient to store image arrays. And that's what we typically do in practice. We don't consider negative pixels, but we consider just positive pixels and define the image coordinate system here, which means that this principal point here must be, must be uh, added to the image coordinates um, such that we obtain only positive coordinates. And that's called the principal point CX and CY that's added to the pixel coordinates after this projection that was discussed on the previous slide. So the complete perspective projection model um, without distortion is given by this equation here, where you can see that now, in addition to um, this uh, multiplying the focal length with x divided by c, we have also now a translation by the principal point. And we have done two more modifications here. So one modification is that we have allowed the focal length in x direction to differ from the focal length in y direction. And we have added another um, scaling factor here um, that allows for um, this is called a skew that are, uh, allows for modeling sensors that are not mounted perpendicular to the optical axis due to manufacturing 
inaccuracies. Fx and Fy, however, would only be independent from each other if we have different pixel aspect ratios and sensors are manufactured typically pretty precise. So in practice, what we often do is we set Fx equal to Fy and also this Q is typically very small so that in practice, often this Q is set to zero. Um, but we have to model in almost all cases that we consider the principal point, right? So while f can be set the same and s can be set to zero, the principal point is still an, an important parameter that we want to uh, estimate and that we want to model. Now, this is um, the full camera matrix that is defined through all of these parameters. And this is called the intrinsic matrix uh, because it's, um, and actually this is, well, this is the projection matrix, the three by four matrix, but the three by three sub matrix here in front is called the calibration matrix K here in red. And this is called the intrinsic matrix because it stores all the intrinsic parameters of the camera. Everything that's intrinsic to the camera, like the focal length, um, the sensor ratio, the, or the pixel ratio, the principal point and so on. And this is opposed to the so-called extrinsic parameters, which is the camera pose with respect to some world coordinate system. That's why it's called intrinsic parameters. And a projection then can be done in homogeneous coordinates by just taking this four dimensional homogeneous vector, this is a, a representing a 3D point in camera coordinate system and projecting it by multiplying it with this matrix. Now, one thing that's nice about this homogeneous representation is that we can chain transformations. So if a 3D point is not represented in camera coordinate systems, but is represented in the world coordinate system, we can chain the transformation, the rigid body transformation that maps a point by multiplying it with this rotation and translation matrix. This is an Euclidean transformation um, that we've seen before. So it multiplies that point and afterwards multiplies that point that is now in camera coordinates with the intrinsic matrix. So we have the extrinsic and the intrinsic matrix here. Um, onto the image plane, we can also do this by simply multiplying these two transformations together into one matrix. And now we have just to do one matrix multiplication instead of two matrix multiplications. And, and in many cases, that's very convenient and can also save time and be more efficient. So here's the mathematical formulation of this. So we have the screen coordinate, which is equal to the camera coordinate or camera, the, uh, the 3D point in camera coordinates multiplied with the intrinsics, um, which is equal to the point in world coordinate multiplied with the extrinsics and the intrinsics. And then we can multiply these two matrices together um, this is a three by three matrix and this is a three by four matrix. So obtain a three by four projection matrix that directly maps a point from world coordinates to the screen. And this three by four projection matrix P can be pre-computed, can be pre-multiplied and then applied for all the points where we wanna apply this projection on. Sometimes it's preferable to use a full rank four by four projection matrix um, where instead of um, you know, a three by four matrix with the intrinsics and a uh, four by four matrix for the extrinsics, we have also a four by four matrix for the uh, intrinsics, where we simply have added a last row with zeros and a one in the last element. Now, this is of course, if we multiply these together, we get a four by four matrix. And now we can take this homogeneous vector, this 4D vector representing a 3D point um, <clears throat> and project it through this matrix and obtain now a four dimensional homogeneous vector X tilde. But because we know this is a point that's on the image screen, we must still normalize this, with respect, normalize this vector with respect to the third coordinate, not with respect to the fourth coordinate. And so what we obtain is this expression here, which is familiar because the first three coordinates are the same. The third coordinate is one by definition. And we have this projection here in the first uh, two coordinates. And um, uh, then uh, the last coordinate here is the inverse step, as you can see here, right? 
And so, um, because this fourth component of this inhomogeneous 4D vector is the inverse depth, if the inverse depth is known, we can use this full rank matrix to also do the inverse. So assume we have this vector where we know the depth, we know the inverse depth as well. Then we can also, now because it's a full rank matrix, we can invert it and go from an image point to the 3D point. And afterwards, in order to extract the 3D point, we need to normalize with respect to the fourth entry because now we have a, a point in 3D space. But of course, we need to know the depth, otherwise this wouldn't be uh, possible. Good. <clears throat> now, the last aspect about the geometric image formation process I want to mention is the lens distortion. We haven't talked about lenses yet, but we'll talk about lenses in the next unit. And lenses are important because, um, as already mentioned, if we just use a very small pinhole, um, we get very little light on the sensor plane. <clears throat> so it's important to have a lens that collects light. But if we have a lens system, then often also there is a geometric distortion introduced uh, and this uh, linear projection model that we've seen before doesn't hold exactly anymore. There's linear, uh, there's lines in 3D that are projected onto curves in the image plane. And this is called distortion. So the assumption of the linear projection that straight lines remain straight on the image plane is violated in practice due to these properties of the camera lenses. <clears throat> and there's two types of distortions. There's radial distortion and tangential distortion. And uh, both of them luckily can be modeled for most camera models and most lens models relatively easily. <clears throat> so uh, here's the, the formula that is most often used. Um, what is done here is we take the point in camera coordinates and first do the normalization by the C coordinate. But we don't multiply the focal length yet. And then we compute the radius. And then with these components, X, Y, and R, we can um, multiply those <clears throat> um, um, with um, um, these, uh, or we can apply these polynomials to them that model the radial distortion and the tangential distortion. So we see here how the X, Y point is transformed through this equation nonlinearly to yield a point X prime that is the distorted point. So from the undistorted point, we get a distorted point. And then this distorted point is multiplied with the focal length. So this is now the focal length from the pinhole model and the principal point is added. And so this is, this is everything that we need to do in order to also model very basic radial and tang tangential distortion. And the nice thing about this is that, well, while this looks ugly um, at first glance, the nice thing is that this can actually be undone. This effect is invertible because these transformations are typically monotonic. So we can pre-compute undistorted images from distorted images and then still apply the pinhole model directly on these undistorted images that have been simply pre-computed before using the image or the projection models that we want to use, the simple pinhole projection model. And that's what's, what's typically used in practice. We are undistorting the images before using them. Now, this is a very relatively simple model. More complex distortion models must be used for more complex lenses, like in particular wide angle lenses that um, do not follow this simple polynomial model. And here's <clears throat> some examples of how this looks like. Uh, you are probably familiar with this. Um, there is uh, an example of a checkerboard here. And if we have so-called barrel distortion, we obtain an effect like here. If we have um, the inverse of that, the negative effect is called pincushion distortion and we get a projection that looks like this. And you can see in both cases, the lines are not projected to lines, but to uh, curves. And also depending on the type of distortion, the projected image becomes smaller or larger. So you need to use a different crop um, on the image sensor um, to fully exploit the projected image. <clears throat> 